that is the wrong class unless you're going to talk about enthalpy of reaction. No? That was fun, I thought. Okay. <clears throat> what? Then we better go over it again. Remember, like, Hess's law and everything like that? Delta H, you had to rearrange equations to match and eliminate. <laughs> See, what's um, the sad thing is, though, since you know, you've already experienced it and you're going to miss out on it. Well, I guess you don't have to miss out on it. In honors camera, we're getting ready to do the electromagnetic spectrum. I think we will. I think we will at some point. Um, so, I mean, we have to. We have to. Section two, talking about capacitance. And so today we're going to relate capacitance to the storage of electrical potential energy in the form of separated charges, calculate the capacitance of various devices, and calculate the energy stored in a capacitor. You are going to have oodles and oodles of stuff to write down on your formula sheet today. So make sure you have that handy. I'm talking oodles, people. So a capacitor itself is a device that is used to store electrical potential energy. And the capacitance is the ability of a conductor to store energy in the form of this electrically separated charges. We met uh, The units for capacitance is farad with a capital F. And it is equal to Coulomb per volt. Now, back in my high school days, which, what year is it now? Okay, oh boy. Um, the late, mid to late 90s, okay, was when I was in high school. And the big thing to do then was to get the craziest car stereo you could and the biggest sound system you could. Yes, even Mr. Dorfler almost <clears throat> had a sound system in his uh, 85 GMC Jimmy with the roof falling down. Um, <clears throat> I did have uh, two 10-inch subwoofers in there. They never, ever got hooked up. But they were um, basically a, a uh, place to where I could put my 6 by 9 speakers in there, which was fine. But anyway... I never got to be like the cool kids when it came to that stuff, but I knew a lot of people who did. And so they had these big, huge, stumping sound systems, right? Have you ever, oh, first of all, is that still a thing now? Yeah. Is it? Okay, I just, for some reason, I don't hear it as often as I thought. Maybe it's because I'm not driving around Springfield uh, as much as I used to. But I mean, I hear some audio systems here, but not close to what I remember it being in high school days. Anyway, so have you been in them? Okay. Um, have you been in them driving at night with them cranked all the way up? Yeah. Okay. I mean, you can tell me the truth because I did. Okay. I mean, we were obeying all the laws except for the sound laws, but um, did you notice anything with the headlights? Aha. Uh -huh. All the headlights and even the, the, the dashboard lights, I remember, would dim every time a big, huge bass would hit on those speakers. That's because it is drawing so much power from the electrical system in the car that it's losing power essentially. And they came up with a way to deal with that. It's called a farad cap, okay? Hence farad cap. So you'd hook these farad caps up through your system and what they would do is they would build up and store electrical potential energy. And so every time you'd have a base hit that would normally drain your lights you no longer had that problem because it would draw the power directly from those capacitors. So it kind of changed. Um, and I'm sure they were on for a, a while before that, but I just remember hearing a lot about that, how um, I knew some friends who had the issue with the lights dimming, and then they ended up spending whatever money they had because they didn't have jobs. Um, they got they dealt with it and they put these fared caps in. And that's what's happening here, okay? We are storing energy or large sudden bursts of electrical needs, okay? So we can maintain the current system. And so we can calculate capacitance by this, taking the magnitude of charge 
on a plate. So again, inside these capacitors, we've got these um, separated plates and separated charges. So we take these magnitudes of charge on each plate and divide it by the potential difference. So the, basically the voltage that's going through them. So there's your first formula you need to write down on your formula sheet. Now, as you can imagine, the level of capacitance will ultimately depend on the size and shape of capacitors. We can have circular shapes, we can have um, rectangular shapes, name it, it could be that, okay? If we have a parallel plate capacitor located in a vacuum, okay, which, you know, sometimes you're going to have it, you've got this equation where capacitance is equal to epsilon with a subscript of zero. Anytime you see the epsilon in something with a subscript of zero, in this case, it's going to mean that it's in a vacuum. And this permittivity of a vacuum is what it's known as, has a essentially a constant value, okay? You're gonna see that there's gonna be permittivity of um, mediums that they're gonna be provided to, say like water or air, okay? A lot of times it might just be the number one, but if it's in a vacuum, that's the value you'd use, okay? If it's not in a vacuum, ultimately you're gonna be given that information, so you can just plug it into the formula. Divided by the area of one of the plates, oh, sorry, times the area of one of the plates divided by the distance between the plates, okay? Make sure you get that number for the permittivity of the medium written down as well. Anytime you see values like that or constants, you're gonna see another constant here today. Um, anytime you see that, make sure you get it written down. It'll make your life easier when you go to calculate this stuff. Speaking of bumping systems, I remember my buddy and I were headed to soccer practice, and he was all about his system. He had an 80, I think an 85 Cadillac. Loved that car. I, I loved it as well. Um, but he always was upgrading his system as much as he could. <laughs> we rolled up to soccer practice one day, um, blasting um, Backstreet Boys. The Backstreet's back all right. Oh, that sounds so good on a system. We definitely got some weird stares though, but hey, it got us pumped up, I tell you what. Anytime that song still comes on, I crank her to 11. All right, everybody got that written down? So, um, there are capacitors in random places, you might think, too. Um, a lot of times, in, in between these plates of a capacitor, we're gonna have what's called a dielectric uh, material, sorry, dielectric material. And what this does, it helps to reduce the field strength of um, the, the capacitor, essentially. So it can have minimal energy usage and only requires a minimal energy usage. Perfect example of this is a keyboard button. And a lot of keyboards, you're going to have the button connected to a movable metal plate. And then on the other side, you're going to have another um, fixed metal plate. But in between there, you're going to have a dielectric material. And that is what's going to help minimize the electric field strength between there to where but every time you hit that button, it'll eventually make a connection and it sends a electrical signal to your computer knowing that it hit, you know, in this case, the B button. So you have capacitors in various locations. Now, the potential energy stored in a charged capacitor is going to depend on the charge and the potential difference between the capacitor's two plates, okay? And there are two alternate, uh, alternate, sorry, I want to say alternative forms, and they are dependent on what variables we are given. So this first statement here is really referring to the yellow formula down here, okay? Where the potential energy is equal to one half Q, which in this case is the charge on plates, times delta V. But we can also calculate the electric potential energy 
through other means, depending on what variables we have. And if we know the capacitance and the voltage, we can use that. If we know the charge and um, the charge on the other plate, we can know that too. So <clears throat> we can do this through various methods. Did you all get that written down? Before I continue, got another one for you. As I mentioned, you can also have a sphere shaped object as acting as a capacitor. And so in order to calculate the capacitance of a sphere, you have to take the radius and divide it by what's called the electrostatic constant. And again, here's the constant value that you need to write down as well. 8.99 times 10 to the 9 newtons times meter squared per coulomb squared. And now I'm pretty sure that's the last formula you're going to write down. The reason why I have this one is because you might see this on your homework tonight. Mr. Dorfler. Who's that? Gage, do we need to write down all three of the formulas on the former slide? Right there? Yeah. I would do so. Okay. The more the merrier, right? <laughs> okay. Let's look at a problem. We have a capacitor connected to a 12 volt battery. Oops. It holds 36 micro coulombs of charge on each plate. What is the capacitance of the capacitor? And how much electrical potential energy is stored in the capacitor? Let's see how I'm trying to, there we go. Um, so what do we know? Well, we know the charge on each plate is 36 micro coulombs, but we want to get it out of the micro for our calculating purposes. And so we're going to use a little bit of um, dimensional analysis, you know, unit conversion to make it equal to 3.6 times 10 to the negative fifth coulombs. <clears throat> our potential difference or our voltage of our battery is going to be 12 volts. We need to figure out the capacitance of the uh, capacitor and how much potential energy, electric potential energy there is. So let's start by solving for <coughs> capacitance. So we know the charge on each plate. We know the, the capital Q. We know the potential difference of 12 volts. So you simply just go ahead and calculate that. And again, remember, um, capacitance is uh, in the units of farads. As you see here, they just took the um, 10 to the negative 6, replaced it with the micro sign, that's fine as well. Or if you want to leave it in uh, scientific notation, that's AOT as well. So we've answered the first question. Next, they wanted us to calculate the potential or electric potential energy. Again, we knew the um, capacitance, or we just calculated the capacitance. We know the potential difference. Again, we actually know quite a bit of information from this problem. We could use any one of those, um, really any one of those formulas, depending, you know, as long as we had the right ones. And so we plug in our values. And we get the electric potential energy of 2.2 times 10 to the negative 4 joules. That's kind of how your homework's going to be. But I still want to do some practice, okay? I want you to open up your books to page 607. 607. All right. Does anybody at home not have their textbook? Because if you don't, we're gonna we're gonna sing. You're gonna sing. So I'm just checking to see if you all have your textbook. I'm gonna take that as a yes. I'm sure you're all being very honest right now. All yeah, right. All um, textbooks. Let's see here. Uh, which one do I want to do? Let's look at. 
Number two. Okay. I'm going to get this. You know, we're going to do number two. So a parallel plate capacitor has a charge of 6.0 microcoulombs when charged by a potential difference of 1.25 volts. First, find its capacitance. Okay. So what do we know? First, we know that Q is going to be equal to 6.0 microcoulombs or 6.0 times 10 to the negative 6 coulombs. We know that our um, potential difference is 1.25 volts. And we are trying to calculate the capacitance. So we're going to use the formula of C is equal to Q over delta V. And we're going to go ahead and just plug in everything. 6.0 times 10 to the negative 6 coulombs divided by 1.25 volts. Double check my calculation, but we should get an answer of 4.8 times 10 to the negative 6 farad. Or if you wanted to put 4.8 microfarads, you could do that as well. Easy peasy, right? Let's check out part B, though. <clears throat> part B says, how much electrical potential energy is stored when the capacitor is connected to a 1.5 volt battery? Okay. So just adding a little bit of information, we have 1.50 volt battery this time. And so we're also going to be checking for the PE. So using what I have... I'm just going to go ahead and do the tried and true one half C times delta V squared. So one half times. <clears throat> do, 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 do. Oh, I lost my place. I lost my place. There it is. 4.8 times 10 to the negative six. Farads times 1.5 volts squared. This time I want you to calculate this and tell me what you get. Do you have an answer? Tie reader? Oh, tie reader. Just got it out, tie reader? Yeah. Oh, tie reader, tie reader. Brian, you got an answer? That's why we do this. Sorry to say that is correct. Don't forget jewels, which leads me to my next thing I want you to write down before we call it a day. Okay. Perfect segue. Very good. Okay. So that's your answer. 5.4 times 10 to negative 6 jewels. Okay. So. I always like to remind, because we just wrote down a ton of stuff today in terms of formulas. So again, write this stuff down. You may already have some form of it somewhere in your in your formula sheet, but write this down. Okay, we're talking about units. So in PE is equal to joule. I know we did some of these the other day, which is also equal to Newton times meter. Okay, let me see if I can't get this. Okay. Q is equal to Coulomb. That's charge. Capacitance is equal to farads, but it's also essentially broken down into Coulombs per volt. Just a reminder for area, and you might see this, is meters squared and volt is equal to joules per coulomb. Now, as you see here, we're using a lot of derived units, okay? Joules, newtons, coulombs, farads, okay? 
you can imagine once you start breaking these down, you're going down a rabbit hole of units that you can cancel out. Okay. That's why I always like to just give you these because instead of taking time that's unnecessary, as long as you know what units you're supposed to have when you're calculating for a particular uh, uh, variable, just put those down there. Don't worry about where they come from if you don't have to. You'll drive yourself batty. Okay, now for the all important homework assignment. So, problem bank B. Do not do the following numbers. So, the numbers I'm getting ready to list are the do nots. Six, seven, and nine. Do not do numbers six, seven, and nine. Again, they are posted to um, Classroom, so you should have access to them. Don't forget, if you have not turned in your uh, problem bank A, they are due by this evening. If you have any questions, again, feel free to uh, send me a message either through Classroom itself or email me. But that's all I have for you today, kids. Hope you all have a great weekend. And again, just keep an eye out for uh, something. I'm going to post something Monday, but it's not going to be homework related. So, oh my gosh, I want to stop recording. Oh, great, that's going to be in the video. Um, anyway, you may sign off now. Um,